All right then, um, so we'll get started. Uh, so as we all know, our, our group, or excuse me, our cost-benefit analysis is on the immediate cost to the government to determine if, free, if providing free birth control is cheaper than paying for public medical cost of birth and related. And we're mainly focusing on women who are uninsured and in need of um, pregnant, oh, excuse me, birth control. And so some abbreviations we have throughout our case is MPV, net present value, IRR, eternal rate of return, TX, Texas. Um, and then I will hand it off to Isaac and he will go over our intangibles. All right, obviously dealing with a project like ours is um, a lot of the benefits slash cons are gonna be a lot of intangibles that we can't really get data on. Uh, but we try to break down some of the things that we have, such as the givens, like the the number of women that are childbearing in the country uh, or of age, um, which is 15 to 44, uh, which is about 6 million people currently um, as of 2020. Um, and then also we took into account uh, areas such as the time it takes to raise babies, obviously years and years uh, taken out, uh, stress increase, um, overall increase in stress. Um, this is a area that predominantly affects minorities also with the, uh, lack of, um, contraception and stuff like that. And then we have things such as loss of freedom. Uh, Texas ranks overall third in teen pregnancy, very high. Um, and then the overall economic toll. I got this, uh, data from the national library of medicine it says in about 2010, so they're a little bit older numbers, so I'd imagine they're um, greatly increased due to inflation as well as overall population increase, um, even with the declining birth rates of, uh, they said around 12 billion plus in economic cost and during each year um, from unplanned pregnancies, which I thought was a very alarming statistic. Um, so we have some of the possible outcomes uh, or effects uh, we have relationship issues, mental health issues. These are definitely areas that um, we would like to help focus with, uh, especially during this day and age with mental health being very, uh, we're being very aware of it. Um, we also have the economic impacts, uh, such as the, uh, I remember you had brought this up, uh, Professor Sweet, towards the beginning of our, our um, looking into this program with uh, the reduction in overall labor, um, like we would have a reduction in labor force due to this, but we would also see a short-term um, gain in our labor force with more and more women um, attending college and pursuing higher education and uh, higher paying jobs. But uh, we could possibly see a long-term uh, shortage in labor. Um, and then also overall, uh, less children would be raised in poverty as uh, access to birth control uh, would definitely benefit mostly uh, poverty-stricken communities, as well as uh, reduction in rates of births within prison. Uh, Three-fourths of incarcerated women are of childbearing age, and 6 to 10% of women are pregnant at the time of incarceration. All right, and then we took a poll, and we asked uh, a lot of the community, mostly uh, friends, family, and UTSA students, um, we got about 150 responses, um, and about 54% of women currently say they are taking birth control, uh, predominantly for, uh, prevention of pregnancy, uh, regular, uh, slash less painful periods and, um, acne, ovarian cysts, cancer, avoiding cancers and stuff like that. Um, but I think a very great number that we see is if we had it free without insurance costs, would you use it? We saw a massive jump up to 84% of uh, women said they would take it. Uh, very similar to the areas um, such as the ones that are currently taking it. And then uh, I'll go ahead and hand it off to Ashley for our assumptions. So for our assumptions, we don't have any startup or initial costs because we would be providing this service through primary care facilities, family planning facilities, and clinics such as Title X and Planned Parenthood. 
Um, so for our total number of uninsured women in need of publicly funded contraceptive services in Texas, for our base case, that number is 668,460. Our yearly growth rate for our base case is 2%. The total number of unintended pregnancies prevented for our base case is 143,350, which converts to about 21%. And then for our, our best case, that number is 200,538, which is about 30% of unintended pregnancies being prevented. And then our worst case is uh, 86,162, which is only about 13% of these unintended pregnancies being prevented. For our family planning costs for uninsured women in need, that number is 156,374,150. The total time zero cost over six years is 986,427,054. The total net savings is 1,028,932,260. And then our savings per uh, one unintended pregnancy is 7,178. Our weighted average cost of capital is 5%. And then we set our payback cutoff to six years. And next, Anthony will be presenting our base and our best case. Our cases start with the number of uninsured women in need of publicly funded contraceptive services. This number increases over time due to our 2% yearly growth rate. The next column is the previous times the percentage of unintended pregnancies prevented, which is, as Ashley stated, 21.44%. Column D is the number of unintended pregnancies prevented times the dollar saved per unintended pregnancy prevented. Our cost co comes from the formula given to us by Professor Sweet. Net cash flows is savings minus costs. Cumulative NPV is the X NPV function using weighted average cost of capital, the relevant net cash flows and relevant years. Incremental NPV is the change in cumulative NPV and the percent of year used shows how much, how long it took the project savings to offset its costs. This leads to a, an incredible NPV of $4.6 billion and IRR of 173.95% and discounted payback of a little under one year. According to standards set for this project, all of these are to be considered acceptable. In our best case, the only change is the percentage of unintended pregnancy prevented, which is 30%. This leads to an astronomical $6.8 billion in PV, IRR of 289.28%, and discounted payback of a little less than three quarters of a year. As before, all of these are to be accepted. Next will be Darshika, who will be presenting our worst case and break even. So uh, looking at the worst case, like the net cash flows and the cumulative NPV, it still looks pretty good, but it's still much lower than the best case. But for the net present value, we got a little over $2 billion, which we accept. For our internal rate of return, we got 84.73%, which we accept because it's greater than our WACC. And for our discounted payback, we got one65 which we also accept because it is lower than our uh, payback cutoff of six years. For the break even, the percentage of unintended pregnancies prevented is 3.771%. And looking at the chart, we can see that it hits break even in 2027, which is year six. And so for the net present value, we got zero, which we accept. The internal rate of return is 5%, which we also accept because it's the same as our WACC. And the discounted payback is six, and we accept it because it equals our uh, payback cutoff of six years. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Okay, so this is just our summary table overall. And as you can see here, it's everything is in green, which means that we are continuing to accept all three cases. So our NPV is still greater than, um, than zero. Clearly here, our break even is the only one that isn't because it is zero. Our eternal rate of return is 
is also green because it is greater than our uh, WACC. And our discounted payback is also in the green just because it is less than our six year, uh, six year cutoff. And here are just the, uh, the percentages we have again that are just the unintended pregnancies that are prevented. That will be prevented if we, <clears throat> if we as assist women who are in need of publicly funded contraceptive services that are uninsured. And then uh, to our model, it is in the government's best interest to prevent the majority of unintended pregnancies by providing free contraceptive services to reduce relevant public medical, medical costs. All right, all right, interesting, good. Um, let me ask some questions. You've got Nasaya, might be the only guest. So you can ask questions too. Um, so to me for this project, um, I think the most interesting thing, I'm really impressed y'all did the survey, especially on such a sensitive issue. Isaac, I hope you didn't send out the survey. Um, <laughs> I initially created it, but I had uh, all the girls in the group, obviously. I right. felt weird as a, as a male probably sending that to females, but I had I asked them, like, were these questions, like, appropriate, like, to ask about, yeah. like, this subject? And they all, like, had, everyone had input into the survey, and uh, they went ahead and spread it and uh, got a lot of responses from it. Yeah, what I find interesting, and I hope y'all bring this case up in your economics class, especially if you take a, mac um, a macro, not a micro, but macro, because I mean, this is really cool stuff. Um, I'm really shocked. I, you know, I don't know how much contraceptive costs for women, but from your data, it's not something you would think is really, really expensive. And yet it's something that's extremely valuable to the woman and yet your, your survey and your analysis shows government providing that has a huge impact on people's behavior. Um, why do you, I mean, that's pretty critical to your case. Why do you think, why are so many women not using something that's not that cost, I mean, maybe cost prohibitive for a poor, a poor woman, I guess, but why do you think the government provided has such a huge impact on that um, behavior? Well, um, as a woman, I do like um, we always have costs. There's always costs for a woman um, and or women with or people with uteruses, period. Um, we already spend monthly to go get our 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 what's the feminine hygiene, whether that's tampons, pads, and that can rack up um, whether it's whether it's a, a keeping, maintaining that with applied, uh, in some states there is still taxes and in other states there's something called a pink tax where they won't get taxed for their feminine services. So sorry, that's my nephew. Um, but I know that there's just so many monthly costs for women where birth control can be put on the back burner as well as it's a cultural thing. Um, so some women, it's a cultural thing and as well as a side effect thing. Uh, so a cultural thing where some women don't see it as, <clears throat> as, as okay to use, but I feel if the government were to make it okay, because in a lot of cultural settings, the government is um, the best way to go. So if the government says it's okay, it's, it's okay to use essentially. But I know for, I know for some of my friends, um, it's just so many costs monthly already to handle women, especially um, getting their regular regular yearly women uh, women wellness exam and getting and getting uh, mammograms, uh, pelvic exams, it just racks up to be to get your full checked out, especially adding the cost of birth control monthly. And thankfully for me, I don't pay anything for mine, but I know for women out of pocket, it can be anywhere from 20 to fifty dollars a month. Yeah, interesting. In fact, Lisa, you're taking my life insurance class, and we're actually going to talk about the cost of being a woman versus being a man when it comes to you know health insurance versus life insurance versus auto insurance. So it's it's definitely an economic issue. I'm sorry, someone else was going to say. Yeah, I also I was like just piggybacking off of what Lisa said. It's like the cultural thing. Um, I think it was also significant that a lot of people would take it if the government provided it for free because I know that a lot of people are afraid to speak of it with their parents if they're younger like if they just turned 18 and they want to go on birth control but they're afraid to talk about it with their parents so if the government provided provided it for free it would be easier for them to access without having 
an awkward conversation with their parents or if their parents are like, no, I don't want Trump birth control, but then that 18 year old can go get it for free from the government. So it's like their own choice to do it. So I feel like that would make a big difference too. Well, it seems like the avenue is pretty important. So that's when you get really sensitive. If schools provide this public schools, you're really going to get some parents, you know, you know, you, you got right. some touchy issues here. You're going to have to think about, especially in a state like Texas. So I won't get into those. I'm a finance guy. So that's why I don't, <laughs> you know, this is, it's, it's, I, I liked, I'm, I'm hoping governments do this type of analysis. I think to me, the biggest concern I have is your case is the savings per unintended pregnancy. Cause you're, you're using a number provided by someone that, you know, what all is in that number. And I know it's tough to really sit down. And that's, I think, where the economists come in. Um, and, and yeah, I think you, you can see the important role of economists to actually scrutinize these numbers and say, what's the real truth on these numbers? Because, you know, you're pulling your numbers from a group that probably had an incentive to and push this type of projects so they might have some exaggeration and you can obviously get a lot of different numbers. But assuming that $7,000 is correct, you know, it is it looks pretty obvious from a financial standpoint that it's going to be money well spent by the taxpayer. Um, yeah, I don't think I have other questions. Nasaya, I don't know if you have a question. Um, all right, so y'all, you, you picked a tough case and you drug Isaac and Anthony into it. Um, so I interesting. Think, um, Isaac was the one who brought this one up. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, you talk, you, you know, I'm always skittish with these social impact type of projects because they are really, really tough to do. Uh, you did a good job with getting the data and you definitely have a passion about the topic, which is always, I think, really, really good. You probably knew going in kind of the result because it's a low cost with a huge benefit on the other side, but you still went through and set it up. Um, so, all right. I don't have any other questions. So um, you're the last team. So good job. And uh, we'll finish up the class here pretty quick. So thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye. All right.